This is 5 O'Clock Shadow on the Pacifica Radio Network, originating at WBAI. I'm Robert Knight. And the situation remains uncertain for the people of Nebraska and environs with the release of a million gallons per second of water into the already overflooded Missouri River. That release at Gavin's Point Dam on the border between Nebraska and South Dakota. The travel time of such a large uh, mass of water down the river is a variable thing depending on the width and uh, the transmission speed and other factors. The expected amount of time for the initial release to go as far south as the Nebraska cities of Blair and Brownville is significant because that's where there are two nuclear power reactors that are already on the verge of being flooded. The one in Blair is a pressurized water reactor, and the one in Brownville is similar to the Mark 1s at Fukushima. It is a, um, a boiling water reactor with elevated spent fuel storage pools. The latest estimate that we have obtained from the Army Corps of Engineers and the National Weather Service and others is that it would have taken a day or two for it to go as far south or further south than Sioux City, Iowa, which is approximately midway-ish on the eastern border of Nebraska. The issue of today is uncertainty as to exactly where that water is going. Because earlier today, there was reported the break of a levee, that is, sandbags on the side of the river, somewhere between Sioux City and um, Omaha region, where the uh, town of Blair is, where the Fort Calhoun nuclear power plant is. It uh, remains to be seen whether that breach will be fixed and thereby send more of that raging water down the Mississippi, further down the Mississippi, towards where it could put into further jeopardy the Fort Calhoun and the Cooper nuclear power plants. We are monitoring the water levels in real time, and we have indeed seen a spike in the what they call the gauge level of number of feet above the normal height of the river in Sioux City. And uh, the details about the points further south along the Missouri River remain uncertain at this time, but we will certainly keep uh, abreast of that story. And uh, in addition to that, there are concerns about the release of radiation in other parts of the world, in particular Fukushima, where there are now being discovered uh, radionuclides not only in the environs of Japan, in the northwest where the normal winds blow, but oddly or in a way that has been covered up or undisclosed by government and official operator sources, uh, southwest towards Tokyo, remarkably high levels of radiation are uh, being discovered, including so-called hot particles, about which uh, we now hear from our nuclear analyst, Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Associates, who speaks of these things even as he appears today in the city of Boston. Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds. There's been a lot of discussion in the press in the last week about Tokyo Electric changing their estimate for the amount of radiation that was released at Fukushima. And there's also been a lot of discussion about radioactive hot particles being discovered all over Japan. Well, I wanted to tie those two together today and talk about just what that means. First, Tokyo Electric recalculated the amount of radiation that came out of Fukushima in the first week. And they discovered that that first week released twice as much radiation as they had thought was released in the entire accident. So it released an enormous amount more than they, they, than they anticipated. But the second piece of that is that most of these new numbers, most of these new radiation particles were hot particles. And here's why. Right after a nuclear fuel melts, it releases all of its gases. And those gases are called xenon and krypton. They're noble gases, they don't react. And they surround the population and bombard the population with gamma rays. Now that part of the calculation is pretty straightforward. That part doesn't change with this new estimate from, from uh, Tokyo Electric. So the xenon and krypton part of the estimate is there. But what's changed is they've realized that an enormous amount more hot particles were released. 
Now, even then, this is an assumption. Remember, all of the radiation detectors were blown to smithereens. And still, they're assuming that about 98% of the radiation is still inside that reactor. But this new radiation is in the form of hot particles. What are they? Cesium, strontium, plutonium, uranium, cobalt-60, and many, many others. Now, when you go outside and you're in a cloud of noble gases, you can pick it up with a radiation detector because you're bombarded by gamma rays. But when you're in hot particles, unless there are many, 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 it's very difficult to detect a single hot particle. But that doesn't mean it's not dangerous. We're discovering by scientists, independent scientists, using air filters in Japan, that the average person in Tokyo breathed in about 10 of these hot particles every day all the way through the month of April. Those same scientists using air filters are discovering that in Fukushima, people were probably breathing in 30 or 40 times more radiation than they were in Tokyo. <clears throat> Again, in the form of a hot particle. And what surprised me was that the air filters in, uh, in Seattle indicate that people there were absorbing five hot particles every day for the month of April. Now, what does that mean? That means that that hot particle gets absorbed in your lung or it winds up in your intestines, or it winds up in your muscle, or it winds up in your bone. Now, it constantly bombards a very narrow piece of tissue. Now, we have here a, a picture of a, of a lung from an ape, and that, there's a hot particle in the lung. And you can see how localized the damage is from that, from that hot particle constantly bombarding the ape's lung. Now, a constant irritant like that, your body fights. And most of the time, your body wins. Sometimes, however, those hot particles can cause a cancer. And, and of course, that's a grave concern. Now, you can't run a Geiger counter over someone's lung on the outside to determine if they have a hot particle. Because those particles, those rays, don't travel outside the body. They do their damage to the local tissue. But we know they're there because the air filter results indicate that they are. Since I was about 16 years old, I used to work on cars a lot. And I know that if I was working on a car in Japan right now, I would be using gloves and a respirator if I was removing the air filter in a car, because I know that there's radiation on those air filters. That's what the independent scientists are telling us. The last thing I'd like to talk about tonight is that there have been reports coming out of Japan of individuals tasting a metallic taste. Now, this is not the first time that that metallic taste has been detected after a nuclear accident. People near Three Mile Island detected a metallic taste in their mouth. People near Chernobyl detected a metallic taste in their mouth. And also patients undergoing radiation therapy for, for cancers also have detected a metallic taste in their mouth. This is anecdotal. It's very difficult to measure, but that we are seeing it in Japan confirms what has already been detected at Three Mile Island and at Chernobyl. Well, that's about it for tonight. Next week, on Thursday, June 16th, I'll be at the Boston Public Library between 6 o'clock and 8 o'clock at night. The topic is Fukushima. Can it happen here in the United States? I'll be with David Lockbaum from the Union of Concerned Scientists and Dr. Richard Clapp, an epidemiologist. If you're in the Massachusetts area, be nice to meet you there. Thank you, and I'll keep in touch. And this is 5 O'Clock Shadow, originating from New York on the Pacifica Radio Network. I'm Robert Knight, and uh, we will, of course, continue.